the, the Voce Vista Video Pro as a biofeedback device. It's great for certain things. It's great for vibrato. You can see, is there vibrato or not? Is it regular? Is it, I argue for something called vibrant singleness of pitch, uh -huh. which is way better for coral. It's better for everything, but it basically, when the rate and extent are within certain parameters, we don't track pitch undulation. We hear a stable pitch that somehow seems lively, uh, sparkly. Yeah. It's, it's, it's analogous to the movies. When you go to the movies, at least in the old days, I don't know what they do with digital, but they used to flash, I think it's 26 still frames per second on the screen. Well, our brain and I can't do 26 per second. Mm -hmm. So we saw, instead of 26 still photos, we saw a smoothly moving picture. Right. Yeah. So if you sense. get within certain uh, periodic parameters, meaning how fast, how many per second, and and uh, excursion limits, we don't hear pitch undulation. Pitch is perception. We perceive pitch. Frequency is the science, is the physics, and pitch is perception. So our perception of pitch is bzzz, but in fact, there is vibrato. That's an ideal vibrato. It's an ideal vibrato for most styles, and it works great in choral settings, because then you're not fighting a bunch of fighting audible waggles. Hello, and welcome to the Choralosophy Podcast. This is episode 160, Practical Vocal Acoustics with Kenneth Bozeman. I'm excited to welcome Professor Bozeman to the podcast this week to blow your minds. Ken is a voice teacher, author, and prominent lecturer presenting all over the world to help teachers of singing understand the importance of the marriage between voice science and the emotive capabilities of the human voice. I have frequently participated in conversations, sometimes arguments, where these two ideas are erroneously set apart from each other. For example, what's more important, vocal technique or emotional expression? To me, this has always been a strange question. It is through our understanding of how the voice works and our ability to pass that along to our students that allows them to have access to the full range of emotional tools that their voice has to offer. In this conversation, Professor Bozeman lays out the many useful scientific concepts, exercises, and techniques to help us marry the soul to the body, so to speak. So stick around for that conversation. Before we get there, I need to tell you about a new tab on the website, Coralosophy.com forward slash vocal ped. This episode is kind of the announcement of this new resource. Uh, my goal by February of next year, which is the fifth anniversary of this show, is to have all of the major topics that we cover on this show subheaded under permalinks, where you can always just go to that link and find episodes about that topic. So, so far we have coralosophy.com forward slash music literacy, all one word. And now we have coralosophy.com forward slash vocal ped, and there are more to come. I plan on doing an assessment tab next, and this should help you stay organized and help me share content. Attention performing arts directors. Are you looking for a platform that understands your unique needs? Look no further than ludus.com. Built from the ground up for the performing arts by people from the arts, Ludus is the perfect solution for your organization. With Ludus, you can drive revenue with ticket sales, merchandise, and fundraising, all while saving time, money, and resources. And the best part? It's 100% free to your program. Sign up for Ludus today and take your performing arts program to the next level. Coralosophy listeners can go to ludus.com forward slash Coralosophy for an upgrade for free to their marketing suite at the producer or above level we have Brian Long, Chandler Smith, Venture Studios, John Warner, Jonah Clixbull, Ulrika Igrain Munoz Alarcon, Angie Schilling, Carlos, David Kowalsik, James Mock, Jared Hendricks, Kyle Peterson, Max Jackson, Michael Heron, Nathan Hines, Ryan Main, and Stephen Kathy Kikachik. Head to patreon.com forward slash Coralosophy and join the crowd. Will you just briefly introduce yourself? Who, who are you? Because we just jumped sure. right in. <laughs> That's quite all right. Ken Bozeman. I'm Ken Bozeman. I taught. I was a professor at Lawrence University Conservatory of Music in Appleton, Wisconsin for 43 years, uh, from 77 till 2019 and 2020. And I um, re retired from that. But my ongoing mission is I developed an interest in the acoustics of voice and how you can use that effectively in the studio. So my my retirement mission in life is to share that information wherever there's interest. I'm not trying to build anything new at this point. I continue to learn. I continue to teach. 
some privately online, and I do uh, seminars in acoustic pedagogy, frankly, all over the world. I was in Thailand in June. I'm going to Scotland in August, I'm going to Michigan in a couple of weeks. Uh, so I do this uh, sort of thing wherever there's interest, wherever I'm invited, I guess I could say, to do that. So, And uh, my wife has developed, a, she's also a wonderful voice teacher, and she's developed an interest in co-authored a book on the changes in female bodies across the lifespan hormonally from, you know, uh, puberty through childbirth, through menopause in particular. She wrote a book, uh, Singing Through Change, Women's Voices in Midlife Menopause and Beyond. It's also a very interesting topic. So we we both travel around and present on those topics. Right. Well, because my question and my thought is, especially with, because I don't, I definitely don't want to talk about Voce Vista the whole time. I just wouldn't want okay. to get a chance to to, yeah, yeah. to, to it, talk about some, yeah, yeah. some applications of it, because you mentioned uh, that your ears become a better source of information at a certain point for whether or not it's, uh, you know, pleasurable vibrato or, or, or right. pleasing vibrato. But I wonder what you think about um, working with students that haven't yet been trained to, to tell the difference. Have you found value with Voce Vista in showing students what it looks like just to try to get at that, you know, help them understand the auditory component by adding a visual component? Because it seems like it's helped me. Yeah. What is it? Tell me this. What has it helped you do? What in particular? Get, get students to see to to see uh, this when the sound is quote unquote right for what we're going for versus when it's not right, and then that helps them remember later which sound was better because they don't necessarily and, and, come in knowing. Right, and and what I'm curious about is is what uh, visual evidence defines right. For you, well, give me an example, in other words. Yeah, so an example would be like if we, uh, if I'm working with an individual singer, uh, different, I, mm -hmm. I teach private lessons and, and in choir, yep. but if yep. with an individual singer, uh, especially young singers who are trying to find kind of the, the ability to access their singer's mm -hmm. format for the first time. All right, right. You, you can really, really see it in You can Voce see Vista. the singer's format. Yeah, mm -hmm. you can see the singer's format. So the things, that, and I wrote about this in my book, my first book, when I, because there's a section on the use of Voce Vista, mm -hmm. you can see singers form it reasonably well, particularly for lower pitched sounds. Yes. When you get really high treble sounds, it becomes less inter it becomes less necessary in the first place. Mm -hmm. When the soprano is really high, she doesn't need much singers form it. But and it also the harmonics get so spread out, it's a little bit less clear. But when you're doing lower pitches, you got a lot of clustered harmonics right in the top octave of the piano where singers form a cluster is. You can see it there, or you can get stronger or weaker. Do you see that very well? You can see vibrancy, either the immediacy, presence, and consistency of vibrancy or of straight tone very well on virtue piece. What's hard to see are other and you can see whoop register very well. Mm. Of all the acoustic registers. Open, close, and whoop. Those are the three registers I write about. They, they're acoustic registers. Could you give us a quick uh, definition of those? I'm yeah, not familiar with yeah. the terminology. So uh, open timbre is whenever you're singing an octave or more below the first resonance of whatever vowel you're on. Acoustic registers are determined by the vowel and particularly by the first format of the first resonance of the vowel, which means acoustic registers are not all at the same location from one vowel to another, because the vowel first formants cover a whole octave. They cover the treble clef. E and U is the bottom of the treble clef. A is the top of the treble clef. A and O is at about C5. And this moves up and down a little bit depending on the voice type. So our register, register, acoustic registers change relative to the harmonic set and the first formant. So the first formant's here, and I'm an octave and more below it. I've got two harmonics below it. As soon as I sing less than an octave, this is the pitch I'm singing, so less than an octave below that first resonance, my second harmonic has risen above the first resonance. I'm now in closed timbre. You got about an octave of closed timbre. Why? Because there's an octave between the first two harmonics. When you are when your pitch song pitch matches the first resonance, now you're in whoop timbre. And that is going to really resonate your fundamental frequency. And your fundamental frequency sounds a lot like Ooh, oh, or maybe awe for a high soprano. Mm -hmm. So you get this this whirling. Do you know what a theremin is? Yes. You get this whirling like theremin quality popping in when you hit whoop register because that that fundamental frequency starts whirling through the timbre like like a, and it sounds domey and 
like a whirling. And then when you drop back to close timbre, it, it, it blends in more and you just hear the overall timbre. It's really rather remarkable. I could play you an example. And you'll, first of all, you'll see that fundamental frequency is really hot when they get into whoop timbre compared to the other harmonics. It'll be a brighter color, you know. Isolate it and let them hear the color of it and then put the, and then let the rest of the sound come back in, which you can mess with the filters and do. And they'll be able to hang on to that piece of the timbre uh, better and hear when it's there or not. Then, then you just play them another. Once, once they learn to hear it, you sort of can't unhear it. Then yeah. every time you hear it, you start hearing it every time you hear a soprano going to whoop timbre. You hear that, that ooh. This is uh, Victoria Clark, and hopefully I'm going to share sound, and hopefully this will work. In Gordon, please. Right, can you hear this? Yep. All right. Here we go. I'll tell you when it pops in. It should be higher. Popped in briefly there. That was open to him on the bottom. Of it. There it was. Mm -hmm. You hear that? That's actually the that's the fundamental frequency that comes in when she hits swoop timbre. Was that clear enough in transmission? I think so, yeah. Yeah. I, I'll I can play hear, that play I, that again. Because you you when it goes out, it's it's more I don't want to say exactly speech like, but it doesn't have all of a sudden that domey whirling quality that whoop timbre gives. Lovely singing all over. There it is. Yeah. Uh -huh. Whirling away. It's cool. It's really cool. Here it is, too. It's on those nose. A little bit there, a little bit there. So most of the soprano range is in close timbre or hoop timbre. Our range is in open timbre or close timbre, rarely in hoop. Guys, lower uh -huh. Out there. A little bit there. A little bit there. Whenever she gets to a certain high pitch, you start hearing it whirling in. So now I will show you very quickly. I'll add a filter and this will be kind of fun. So we'll skip over to that. Come on. There we go. So I'm isolating the, the first format. Um, and we'll just continue. There's the color of that whooping. I'm going to try to make it louder for you. That's the fundamental frequency sound. Here it comes. Well, the, the ones that I was playing for you a moment ago are coming up, I think. Here they come. There it is, that sound. Uh huh. So now, if I and sorry, I'm going to interrupt for just a second because the, the so my audience that's audio only, I just want to narrate for a second what you're okay. What, what oh, we're seeing on the YouTube version, uh, what we're seeing here is that uh, Kenneth has um, basically filtered away all of the overtones and the the the, the parts of the sound that we would normally hear. 
and he's isolated just that that fundamental. Am I explaining that correctly? Yes, that's correct. Right. Okay. So I'll play that spot again, then I'll add all of them back in again, right? All the sounds back in again. I'll just play that last little bit of that. I don't need to go right that far back. Okay, here's this fundamental frequency thing again. And it went back further than I wanted it to. There it is, that whirling sound. Here we go, right here. Good, now, if I take the filters away, okay, so I'm gonna click right back to the start of that thing we just heard and see if you can still hear that Could you still hear that mm -hmm. fundamental whirling through? Oh yeah. And you can play with it. You can play with this a lot. Of, here's a, another fun way to do it, is you can put two, two frequency filters on it. So I'll be able to make the fundamental hotter or less to show you what it sounds like when we play this. Did that pop it out a little more? Yeah. Uh huh. And if I do the opposite with the above part, so you can hear what it is contributing or not. So you can play with those things, and whoop timbre is very dis very distinct. And you can he begin to hear the fundamental because the harmonics are so spread out relative to our range by, by the time you're that high, it's easier to hear an individual harmonic like that and hear whoop timbre. Whereas lower, where you got more, a lot more harmonics within hearing range, it blends together and begins to sound more speech-like. And you, unless you hear spectrally, like harmonic singers train themselves to hear, we tend to hear linguistically. And the, the analogy I use for that is, um, pointillism in art. Are you familiar with pointillism? Yeah, That's where uh -huh. those little dot, dots of pixels of pure color. Yep. Well, hearing spectrally is like standing up close to a pointillistic painting. You can hear individual harmonics with their individual tone colors uh, unblended. But when you back away, your brain and eye tends to bl blur it all together. That's hearing linguistically, which is the way we mostly have trained ourselves to hear because of language. So we hear the various parts of the sound blended together into a composite timbre, a vowel. Yeah. Whereas vowels are actually vowels are typically made of two primary tone colors blended together. The first form and the second form I call the under vowel, the over vowel. We tend to focus on whichever of those two carries the most identifying tone color of that vowel. Our, uh -huh. our frequencies have a tone color. Thank you, Ian Howell. He, he brought this information to us. And basically, it sounds it goes from ooh, low or ooh, higher e, and other vowels are in between. And uh, some vowels are mixed. You have a lower harmonic and a higher harmonic blended together to create a vowel color. So an, an e vowel is literally an ooh and an e blend, blended together. Because we hear linguistically, we tend to go for the target tone color, which is the higher one, e. And people tend to over articulate the target tone color, and that messes up their resonance. Yeah. So, so I, actually, so I have a question that I want to go yeah. back before we get too far beyond it to this whoop timbre that the example you were playing a second ago of this beautiful soprano yes, voice. Yes, yes. Now, yes. it kind of taking it out of the lab, so to speak, and into right. the, the world. Um, yes. it, uh, it, actually, if you wouldn't mind, will you unshare the screen just so that yeah, our faces uh, are, bigger, are, are bigger absolutely. while we talk? Yep. That's great. And so... Um, my so then the question is I've heard many you know voice teachers and choir directors over the years say things like um, could could you find more ooh in your e sound right you know, those types of things um, is is that really what they're trying to say do you think is that like a I, similar I think that's what they're going for the thing that's misleading about that is the under vowel and that's the under vowel it's the, the first uh, format is you do not shape the resonator as if that ooh were your target vowel. Right. 
Yep. And so how in the world can you shape an E and an U at the same time? You can't, okay? If you do, you're doing U, which isn't either, really. Okay? And that's in choir, that's what we get. Yes. Right, right. Uh -huh. And a lot of teachers realizing, oh, your E needs more U, just sing U, you know, or your A needs more U uh, or O, oh, just sing, you know, they will actually substitute the shape of the complementary vowel. I call one of those two colors is the target color of the vowel you're going for. The, you know, the identifying tone color. The other harmonic is a complementary, completing, modifying color that's just built into a well-shaped target vowel. Uh -huh. If I over-articulate the E, I will have a tight, exaggerated E. If I do a nice one, E, E, it has built in E and E. Now you say, well, that's not an OO, correct, because we're not hearing spectrally. If I isolated that lower harmonic, it would sound like an OO. But we tend to hear the complementary vowel color blended with the target vowel color. So if you take an E, an OO, and blend it with an E, you get something like E, 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 E. So you need some E in your E, so that it isn't E, E, and you do that primarily just by being making a nice, relaxed, nice E, 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 E. So, so, and I've got a whole chart which shows you what those complementary vowels probably will sound like to you, even mm -hmm. though they're literally O or O. Like an an E is an E, an E, and an O color. But it, you mix A and O together, you get a kind of an E, uh, E, uh, E, uh, E uh, is an over-articulated target vowel. E, uh, but E, uh, E uh, is an E uh, that's just relaxed and comfortable. E, uh, and it has some E, uh, E uh, built into it. The other interesting thing, and this is very relevant for solo singing and choral singing, is when you ascend the range, vowels will always, if you let them, a well-produced vowel will always migrate toward its complementary tone color. Mm -hmm. So, for example, an E vowel will migrate toward E, E, instead of E, E, E. An E vowel will migrate towards that E. Uh, it's just almost a, a schwa-like, but, but through the same shape. You try to really keep the shape so that it actually still has some air tone color in it, mm -hmm. but it's going to migrate towards the complement. An A ah, is literally an A ah harmonic and an O harmonic, but we hear that O harmonic blended with the A ah as a kind of an O. Uh, uh. ah. Exactly the same shape at a higher pitch will yield more uh, uh mixed in with your ah. Uh. Yeah. You don't shape uh uh. You leave an ah uh shape, or you'll get it. You'll get. You don't do ah. Uh, it's ah, uh, and you let it migrate towards its complement through the same shape and through an you know an easy laryngeal registration, and it will just migrate there and back. Yeah, you can do this with every vowel. Yeah, and I th I find that um, that even just like that visualization that you used a minute ago with Voce Vista and and you thinking of that as a tool um, in what I think this speaks to the question I was trying to ask when we first started talking about it, which was with students. Sometimes I find that it makes them better to, better at hearing these things once they are once I kind of prove to them that all these things are really happening in there. Because, like, for example, if I were to, you know, sing, um, if I were to sing, e -e -e -e, and then ask a bunch of high school students, what vowel did I just sing? They're going to sing, they're going to say E, and then I'll say, actually, right. no, there, uh, I, there was, there was ooh in there as well. And they'll be like, nuh-uh. And then, right. and, then I'll, and then I'll prove it. And then it kind right. of opens their mind to the idea that, that, that the vocal acoustics aspect is so much more complicated than, yep. than they thought, and then they can start to listen for those things as well. It's kind of like a shortcut, a hack. 
they, they, they probably will never be able to hear the ooh in an E in our voices, but they would be able to in a high enough voice because you'll begin with, once you go to whoop timbre, you can really hear that fundamental frequency, but you can filter it out and that's, show it to them. That's what I mean. Yes. Uh huh. Yes, absolutely. You can filter it out and play it for them. They go, oh, then e, an E is made up of an E harmonic and an ooh harmonic. Probably because I hear where our brains have learned to listen blended, we will hear that ooh harmonic as an E instead of an ooh. E, so that it isn't just e, 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 the e. So you just heard Professor Bozeman and Saw, if you're on the YouTube channel, demonstrate a way that we can describe vocal acoustics and show vocal acoustics to our students. I use this in my classroom, and you can get a copy for your classroom by going to the link in the show notes, which is corelosophy.com forward slash voce hyphen vista. And you can get a copy at a 10% discount by clicking the link on that site and then entering the Corelosophy code at checkout on their website. And they will knock 10% off whether you're getting the, the normal version or the pro version. So go check that out. It is absolutely worth the time and energy to learn how to use that software with your voice students and your choir students. So I'm closing my glottis and then I'm forming vowels, the sequence E, A, 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 O, U. And then I'm thumping the side of my larynx, which introduces a low pitched frequency into the vocal tract that tends to play the first formant predominantly. You can hear other things, but it's mostly the first formant, the pitch of the first formant. That's the pattern of first formant relationships in the, in the vocal tract. <laughs> that is so form- cool. <laughs> The second format you can hear in this whisper, I do something called a chiaroscuro whisper, which is really useful, but it's not a typical whisper. It's a very relaxed, soothing whisper. And see if you can hear this. I don't have my keyboard with me, but I can whistle it for you. If I do this, were you able to hear those pitches when I was whispering it? Yes. That's my second format. So my first format, I can maybe use the whisper to bring it up. The whisper tends to make us hear high frequency, but if I, I'll try to make the first. Now hear the duet. Usually you can pull out the duet between the first several vowels where they're spread apart. Once they get close enough together, they sort of blend together to our brain is one thing, but you can hear that. So you begin to realize, oh, vowels are made of two sounds blended together. Uh-huh. And I can I can use this Cowder's Go to Whisper thing, which I have YouTube things up on it, to practice shaping, tuning those things really nicely, the most pleasurable way possible. Why? Because pleasure is your measure for efficiency. Yes. Basically. Now I've heard you say that before, and I want you to let's talk about that for a second because it was on my list right. of like how do we define pleasure? Number one, and why yep. does it matter? So. You know, pleasure may not be precisely the right word. We're talking about ease, comfort. That's what we're talking about. Yep. Okay. So if something is really comfortable, I call that pleasurable. Your body likes to do it, and it will like to find that find that option and return to it often. The less comfortable it is, the less pleasurable it is, and your body will not like that sensation, and it won't want to go there. Ingo Tietze, a very prominent voice scientist, wrote an article in the Journal of Singing about a year or so ago, in which he said, he used fancy terms, he said, synergistic biological systems, which just means interactive living things, okay, Mm -hmm. interactive living systems, tend to self-organize for efficiency. Mm -hmm. If, if. Because you can't just say, well, that, well, why are, we, why are they even teachers? If they're going to self-organize anyway, why do you need me, <laughs> right? No, if you give them appropriate output targets, and if they have enough flexibility to explore options to find the most efficient way to achieve that output target, 
And I've added to that, and how do they know when they've achieved that most efficient output target? Because it feels good. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. the one that feels the best. That's how the body sorts options toward a target till it finds the one that's the most efficient. It feels the best. Yeah. It's the less, you know, excess effort wear everything. It just feels better. So pleasure, I, I, I even say this, this is my latest mantra, and it's, it's a slightly hyperbolic, but I say language is the problem. And I love language, by the way, language is the problem. Expression is the solution. Satisfying, pleasurable expression is the solution. And I say that for this reason. This instrument is designed however whatever your worldview is by god or nature it is designed to express feelings to be played by feelings it, we we use voice in response to the impulse the soul's impulse to express feelings before language ever happened evolutionarily before language came along and individually before we learned language we played this thing to express feelings full stop it is designed to be played by feelings. Feelings play it better than anything else. So here I am talking and I have I have inflective prosody and melody. I'm not planning the pitch changes at all. I'm just speaking expressively. Mm -hmm. An expression causes the pitch to move around. It's playing the instrument, right? Mm -hmm. So language is the problem. Why is language the problem? Because we get our our, because of appropriate targets. Ingo Tietz says, you, if you give them appropriate targets, we get our targets for language, both the sensations of, of the, the sound and the timbre of the sound from speech range targets. And then we try to make those sensations and those sounds stay the same up and down the range, and they cannot. They have to migrate. Yeah. What so are your What are some of your favorite examples of that, by the way? Well, the really obvious one is the e vowel. If you take an e vowel, which is fairly closed mouthed, e, even a well produced one, e. If you try to take that shape and that sensation, and and don't change anything and run up the scale, it will not work. Mm -hmm. Okay, you will strangle. So, <clears throat> uh, but if you realize, oh, there's an e tone color, there's an that tone color is in there, and there's a low one in there. But as I go higher, the one that identifies the E is the higher one. I can I can raise that lower one by opening my mouth, but I've got to keep that higher one there. So if I go, and people that are just hearing audio only, I will keep going for that basic auditory target, that pitch and that E-like noise of my second format as I open my mouth, expressively and with as comfortable a neck as possible. Now I'm going to speak at speech level through that shape to show you how weird that is. Mm -hmm. But you kept hearing that, that E pitch. E, 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 E. That is actually a good shape for a high note on an E vowel. At a low note, it sounds kind of weird. Yeah. Uh-huh. But if I were doing yee-haw, yee-ee, yee-ee, up there it just sounds like an E. If I go yee with my normal E shape, it won't work up there. Yeah. Right. So there's an example, for example. Wow. Yeah. So do you ever um uh, I, I think I've heard you talk about this before, and so I'm pretty sure I know the answer to this, but my audience might not. Um, when you're try working with students to try it in a practical context, trying to get right. kid, uh, young people, adults, young adults, um, whoever it is that you're working with, uh, to find these sounds, uh, do you like to uh, kind of play with the, the speech voice and integrate that into the singing voice? Is that a common thing for you? I know I like to do that in choir rehearsals a lot. Yes. Yes, I do feel like at speech range, we can definitely start with just nicely formed speech level sounds and mm -hmm. shapes and sensations. Then it's just a matter of 
knowing vowel by vowel when you have to start messing with that. Do you have any favorite examples? So for example, I'm giving you one of mine and this might spur okay. spur your thoughts yep. here. So, yep. um, and to, I've, I've used this on the show before. Always, I like to lead with the disclaimer. Um, oh, this is with love to my, pri- my private school mm-hmm. colleagues. But I use a, I use a voice that I like to call my private school voice when I'm trying to help right. when I'm trying to help my young adolescent boys find a head resonance that is right. not necessarily um, normal for their cultural speech. But they can right. they can mimic it a whole lot easier than they can if I just say, "Hey, sing a D above a middle C when you're 15 right. years old," and you know. Um, and, and so do, are, are there uh, expressions or different types of things that you like to use in your in your work with singers? Yeah, so let me, several comments about that. We are in a group of species called vocal learners. Mm -hmm. There are so far about eight of those identified, and it's a really odd batch. Whales, seals, dolphins, bats, songbirds, hummingbirds. We're the only primates. And vocal learners, lots of creatures on the planet make noises, make sounds. Vocal learners is the subset that can learn new sounds and put them together in new patterns. So they can learn language, they can learn songs, they can learn, you know, complicated songs. And why do we care? Vocal learners' brains are wired a certain way. And how do vocal learners learn? By imitation and playful, pleasurable exploration. Mm -hmm. So what you did is you modeled for them a sound that with imitation and playful, pleasurable exploration, they can probably replicate or they can gradually replicate better and better. This is how we learn to speak. This is how we learn tunes. The other piece to that is, is they tend to learn things in short segments. Like, and this is good for learning repertoire, by the way. Learn a short segment, pleasurably repeat it till you really go down, then another short segment. And then you can put them together in varying patterns. I like improv, actually. That's how jazz improv works. People learn patterns, little short patterns, and then they put them together, scale forms, patterns, and then their brain can mix and match and, and do all kinds of things with them. Mm-hmm. Anyway, okay. so now, and then the third piece was what I mentioned earlier. Voice is activated in response to the soul's impulse to express feelings. So you you feelings as well as sort of caricaturing is what you were doing, right? Uh, so I combine those. So for example, here's one that I use that I got from a colleague in Boston, but I'm sure she got it somewhere else too. This is just things you grab from the culture like mm-hmm. you did with that one, which is the toddler, I want my mommy affect. Mm-hmm. I want my mommy, want my mommy. It completely throws me into my head voice and, and I'm kind of, you know, going to the want my mommy. I want my mommy. That's one that I use. It will definitely throw you into laryngeal head voice, smoother registration, but I'm still using speed. So I'm getting my vowels, right? Another one that's not so good for that, but it's good for just exploring vibrator buzziness, which basically means high spectral content. If there's some buzz in the sound, you've got some high harmonics in the sound, which means good chord closure. It's not breathy. Right. And across your range, you want low range to be very buzzy and you want to gradually get a less coarsely buzzy, more refined buzzy and eventually totally smooth if you get high enough. That's that's uh, there are acoustic reasons for that, but I'll leave it at that for now. That's that will be indicative of good chord function. If it's too buzzy, too high, you're screaming. If it's too smooth, too low, it'll be too weak. They won't have enough power. Right. Uh, so that's, that's why you want to go from buzzy to sizzly to smooth. So I use what I call toddler complaint. And this is a good warm up like thing. Toddler complaint is when that same toddler doesn't get its way. They make this sort of a nasally kind of but dark and you know, uh, uh, uh. you want to do that very pleasurably. You don't try to drive it anywhere, stick it anywhere. Find the most pleasurable way to express your express your displeasure. Uh, uh, sort of dark and buzzy and say, ah, it's, uh, it's right in the mouth. <clears throat> and then as you go up, it will migrate from that uh, to kind of an uh, uh, kind of an uh, uh, and much smoother. Uh, and here's several things that happen. It goes from coarse to refined to almost smooth. It goes from an uh to kind of an uh, and it goes from the mouth 
to sort of inside and up into the head at the same time that it stays relaxed down into the body, kind of like that. And, and I forgot one more. The affect is migrating as well. Down low, it's I'm going to complain till mommy gives me what I want. <laughs> and that's not and when that isn't working. Now I'm going to try to make mommy feel sorry for me. So when I go high, it's the pathetic feel sorry for me, mommy. When I'm low, it's give me what I want, mommy. Right. So. Uh, 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 and if you play with that enough and play with the path in between that kind of migration of vowel auditory roughness, which is the buzziness and sensation location, indirectly trains the larynx to go through all of its, all the stuff it needs to be doing, which we can't directly control. Yeah. Now, why do you suppose it is? Because I've had the same experience with teaching young singers of where I can just, I can get them to make those sounds so much easier than if I go directly to the singing. Um, and, and I, and I've know that intuitively to be true, but I've just never really understood or been able to explain why that's true. So I will add one more to my language is the problem. Uh huh. Language is the problem and pitch notation is the problem. <laughs> yeah. So it's those two things that the brain has categorized differently than what, what I was just doing which is just messing around with my voice and glissandoing all around. I'm going through la language sounds, I'm going through pitch frequencies, but I'm not doing it so categorically and as quantally sort of, you know, uh, as I do when I think I've got to do this vowel, I've got to do this pitch. And I, I think it's a programming problem, really a brain programming problem. Yeah. So the more you can play around with uh, sirening around and allowing the migrations to go where it feels the most pleasurable, and then try to carry that over to scalar pitch patterns and convince yourself to feel it the same way. You can make the transfer, but it is a bit of a process, but it's, it's a process that's quite doable. I mean, I, you know, we do it all the time and I do that all the time with them, but, but they've got to, they have to have enough experience with these migrations. What are my auditory and somatosensory targets? It just means my sound and sensation targets across the range for this vowel. And really learn what that is. This is called procedural knowledge. Procedural knowledge, um, for declarative knowledge is just the facts, ma'am, right? What are the facts? What's the objective information? But we don't sing with that. It informs our singing. We sing with the sensations. It's like, how do you ride a bike? Well, we can talk about gravity and weight, you know, center of gravity and so forth. But I can tell you all that stuff, but that doesn't mean you can ride the bike. Now you have to have felt what it feels like to balance your weight while you're moving forward. Same thing with that's called procedural knowledge because procedural knowledge is utterly sensorial. Yeah, it's all sensory. It's all sensory. It's very hard to describe sometimes very hard to describe it precisely because it's sensorial. But that's the knowledge you need to sing with. So we teachers do the best we can to describe sensations and targets and so forth to help them ha accidentally have some good experiences. And then if they can have them often enough, they, they're no longer accidental. They can begin to form a memory bank of sensory procedural knowledge with which they can then sing. Yeah, no, so that, anyway. that's great. That's great because you said accidentally make, making a good sound. Yeah. I, I, that, is yeah. so, that is so common uh, with, young, are, with young singers. Mm -hmm. we, are in the, uh, we are in the business of setting up good accidents, <laughs> uh -huh. you know, yeah. until they're no longer accidents. And if they don't have yeah. the ability to, to exp uh, explore and playfully um, yeah. feel through these things, then those accidents will never happen. And I think we'll, sometimes, we'll I think that's sometimes the downfall of, uh, of voice teachers and choir directors that, that I, in my experience is that, and I did it too. I was very guilty of it in my younger career where I would say, well, this is how it felt like for me. And this is how it worked for me. And therefore you should do these th things and right. be, being too, right. pres almost too prescriptive, prescriptive to, right. to the point where then, then the singer goes right to that language and notated pitch is the problem pro problem, so to speak, where, yep. you know, yep. Mr. Mr. Munz told me to do exactly this with my jaw and exactly this with my tongue on this pitch. And then, and then they're so up in their head about the, the what is the correct answer that they aren't right. ever able to discover how it works for themselves. 
Right. It is useful to know what the appropriate auditory targets and somatosensory targets are. Mm -hmm. To have someone at least try to describe what it's likely to feel like, and what uh -huh. it's likely to sound like to you from the inside. Mm -hmm. but that, that third piece was there's got to be enough flexibility in your exploration so that you can, your body's got, and you, it, it, this is kind of cool. Uh, in some sense, as long as it doesn't hurt, all of your attempts are useful because it's data for your body. Oh, that felt pretty good. Oh, over here, that felt pretty good. It's, it's narrowing in on the best, the sweet spot, right? Mm -hmm. The one that feels the best. So all of those passes are useful data, sensorial data for your brain to narrow in and zero in on the sweet spot. It's yeah. not like, oh, that was no good. Oh, that was no good. Oh, that was no good. No, 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 no. Actually, those are useful. Just keep playing and keep searching for the pleasurable one. And it, these, all these will help you. Okay, I went a little too far that went a little too far this way. All right, that feels a little bit better there. It does help me to know, oh, I can't hold E all the way up. No, you can't. Let it go E. You know, we can give them some coaching from the declarative knowledge, which is the just the facts, ma'am. But they got to explore playfully, pleasurably, and zero in until they get the sensation that is actually the answer that they're looking for. Yeah. That the ideal coordination that feels good achieves the target that you want the teachers on the outside that can yep we will buy that as an e vowel yeah we'll buy that as an a vowel that's good you mm -hmm. know what did it feel like we always get their feedback what did it feel did it feel good enough you know, did that feel good did it feel easier feel like you could do that all night long without wearing out mm -hmm. you know so yeah yeah okay so uh, if it's okay, I, uh, and as we kind of wrap, getting close to wrapping this up, I want to take us in one slight, di slightly different direction, uh, put you on the spot just a little bit, because whenever I talk about th uh, this kind of thing with a voice specialist, um, I'm always interested to know um, what the guest in your case thinks about, uh, for example, are, are there any common vocal uh, instructional myths that are kind of your pet peeve? Uh, it's because I feel like every voice teacher has them. Um, and then, right. yeah. And so like, yeah, I mean, it just, I'll, I'll start, I'll stop there to see if you have any of those. Yeah, I do. I do. Uh, and they, they often crop up in choral situations because frankly, you know, that's about the hardest place in, in the planet to manage vocal sound because yeah. it's like a doctor trying to diagnose 40 people at once. I mean, come on. <laughs> yep. So I have all the respect and, you know, <laughs> in the world for that. I love choral singing. Uh, but uh, for example, the idea that a radically lowered jaw is a relaxed jaw is just not true. Mm -hmm. It's not true. So first of all, or that a vertical oblong shape of the mouth is the best acoustic shape to make. So I, I make these comments. I say, okay, for starters, I've yet to meet a human being whose closed mouth when they're just relaxed and sitting there is a vertical slit. Mm, it's mm -hmm. not it's a horizontal slit <laughs> and when you relax it it barely opens to basically a lateral oval mm -hmm. it isn't lateralized it just is lateral in shape that is a relaxed jaw and if you'll notice when people speak they usually don't go any further than that in their speaking range e -a -a -o, e -a -a -o. they don't go e -a -a -o. It takes muscular effort to open the jaw further than that, which doesn't mean that we never do that. We do that for acoustic reasons and, and as we get higher in the range, but we actually don't need to do that in the middle range if we find a good e -a -a -a, e -a -a -a. I don't need to go uh, e -a 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 or e -a -a -a, e -a -a -a. will give me a nice balanced ringy deep sound. So over opening the mouth, uh, will dull the timbre. Yes. And if you've got a choir full of people that are strident and they're not resonant and not doing things, it's a very quick way to eliminate some of that higher frequency stridency. It's not the best solution for the individual singer. Uh, and I don't think it's the best choral sound personally, but I understand why it's an easy resort to some choral directors. So we want the jaw comfortably relaxed, but we want it expressive. I just say, use warm hearted emotions. Yeah, 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 go to the I want my mommy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Instead of 
manipulating the shape and making too many long, long faced uh, looks. When do you need that? That when do you need that more opening for your treble voices, for your lower voices, if they're doing an E or an U higher in their range, because you have to open the mouth more for E and U sooner. For your treble voices, as they get above C5 in particular and on up, particularly above the treble clef, they're going to need to be opening their mouths quite a bit more. But they don't have to pull the corners in if the pharynx is tuned well. So the myth, so let me unpack that then for the choir director yep. listening. So the myth then oftentimes comes in when the, the blanket solution from the choir teacher is right. just open your mouth or, right. uh, or open your mouth more, or we need to have tall vowels, which then can op oftentimes be interpreted by which the Which we singer. want, I agree with. Yep. Yes, but, but, but if it's a visual thing, then the singer yep. starts to learn to overextend. And right. like, you, like you mentioned, uh, diagnosing a room full of 40 people, the other thing that, Hardest, choir, yeah. that choir teachers uh, sometimes need to contend with is that uh, I might have like the people pleaser student who, yeah, hears absolutely. Me say, who, who hears me say, make more space, open your mouth, and then and but they, she's, they she's already doing it, and then they overdo right. it just to make you happy. Yeah. Yep. 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 There's that, that, all of that, all of that, which is why it's so complicated to, to do. The safest, this is why I said earlier that language is the problem language. And I'll add to that and notation of notes, but so expression is the solution. If you can get them to playfully express something this warm hearted and pleasurably done, yeah, and go with the expression. Say, Don't worry about the vowel. Think a man, I say, suggest the vowel. Don't do the vowel, suggest the vowel and do the feeling. Yeah, and so, yeah, yeah, it tends to give you a, 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 a well-tuned pharynx where frankly, most of the action is happening. Uh, by, oh, by the way, before I, if I say that, if I drop that in there, I have to say this qualifier is completely natural to perceive bright as forward and dark as back. As far as I know, that's a universal perception mm -hmm. to everybody. It feels like bright is forward and dark is back. It's misleading in terms of resonance shaping. Bright is forward tends to lead to a mouthy spread bright. A <laughs> dark is and a raised larynx. Dark in back tends to lead to a muffled fake opera singer. <sighs> if you exaggerate either of those concepts, if you reverse them, which actually is kind of true acoustically from, from tuning and put bright in the back. Hey, 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 ah. And then the darker component, which is that like the E is that E, E. If I go E, it's no good. If I go E to the front and ringy E in the back, I get balanced chiaroscuro. And curiously, when I reverse where bright and dark are conceptually, I can think either one of them and I get the same sound. Mm -hmm. Bright in back, E, dark in front, E, bright in front, E, dark in back, E, I get false positions. So even though it's a completely natural to think of bright as forward and dark as back, reversing them is very useful pedagogically. Okay. E, okay. Like a, and, and, and why? Because affects are on the pharyngeal plane. It's not that far back, actually. It's in front of your ears. E, 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 we'll, we'll, uh, we'll balance the timbre. I've got I'm another one for you. Of... No, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Go, I've got another one for you if it's okay. So um, what are your thoughts on the, I think this is common in choir rehearsals, but it's also probably common in some voice, individual voice scenarios as well. When the, uh, the, the, the teacher or the director hears something that they perceive as a lack of just overall resonating space inside of the mouth. Mm -hmm. And 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 then the quick band-aid solution oftentimes is, oh, well, that singer just needs to raise their soft palate. So everybody, let's just really raise our soft palate. We hear right. it all the time. Mm -hmm. Thoughts right. about that? I, I'm not one that likes to deliberately do that. There are some good teachers that are effective with that sort of terminology. Um, I prefer to use affect or articulating articulation uh, means of getting that to happen. What do I mean by articulation? Um, if you do a voiced plosive consonant, your palate is up. You, you can't do a plosive without your palate being up. You have to shut the nose off in order to be able to do a plosive consonant. 
So for if they're nasalizing, for example, and they have a droopy palate, you know, there's two different kinds of nasality. There's the the uh, really dulled that kind of nasality there because the nose is actually a muffler. That twangy sound that we associate with nasality is coming out of your mouth, not of your nose. Mm -hmm. But it does accompany nasalization. I admit that. But it's changing the resonances of the vocal tract because twang would be completely muffled going through the nose. The nose is an utter muffler. It's not a twanger. But nasality sounds twangy to us. So if I do e e, yeah, there is airflow out my nose e. But it changed that the twangy sound is coming out of my mouth, caused by the nasalizing factor. But it's but it's not coming out my nose really. Anyway, uh, so if you do a b, if if, if it's if it's um, I'm, I'm kind of got off track a little of your question. Raising Talking the about palate. the soft palate as the yeah, as raising the, the palate. Panacea. You use affect and realize you want to be pharyngeal. So I'll have kids put two fingers on their sternal notch and two fingers right in front of their ears and say, here's the plane of your sound. E, A, E, 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 A, E. And then use expression, E, or the, even the one that you used earlier, which was perfectly fine, that imitation uh, uh, private, private school private voice. School voice yeah. yeah, yeah. E, A, E, but usually sort of, pathos and empathy, e -A -A, or e -A -A, naughty mischief, e -A -A, yeah, okay, sure, yeah. And by the way, in that regard, a lot of teachers will say, don't smile, it will spread the tone. Mm. Old Italians used to say, inhale through a smile, it opens the throat. Well, who's right? If you do a smile, a facey smile, the, first of all, the teachers that say, don't smile, it will spread the tone, they are correct that a smile pretty much always accompanies a spread tone. The difference is the smile is not the cause of the spread tone. Mm. The, a mistuned pharynx is the spread of the, the, the cause of the spread tone. So for example, if you just sit there and think of something funny, okay, that's really funny that I'm smiling, but and the smile is really more about the, the effect of the affect on your pharynx. Okay, yeah, yai, yai. That's not a spread tone. Yai, yai, that's a spread tone. If my larynx is high, I've mistuned my pharynx. Yai, yay, yai, yai. As long as the pharynx is well tuned, the facial smile will not spread the tone. But it's an inside out thing, it's not an outside in thing. Mm -hmm. Do the feeling, and if it happens to have a smile, not a problem if your pharynx is tuned. Because what's tuning your pharynx? Ex expression, feelings, the thing that's supposed to be playing this voice. Yeah, yay, yay, yay. If I use empathy, yay, yay. I still have a relatively lateral shape. I didn't go, yay, 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 yay. But it has depth. Inside, it's not lateral. Back in there, it's not lateral. It's quite vertical. Yay, yay. It isn't yay, 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 yay. But the mouth is secondary to that, to the pharyngeal tuning. Yeah. So it sounds like um, if I could kind of summarize this as we wrap up the, the all the conversation and all of the the demonstrations that you've done for us today, um, if I could summarize what I've learned is that oftentimes it's, I mean, in all cases, especially for teachers, it's valuable for us to know the science of what of what is actually happening and what's going on, but then when we transfer it into the realm of working with students, um, we could basically bust their brain by by teaching only the science aspect of it. What's really more effective is getting them to connect those concepts to these emotional expressions that are yep. that are happy, comfortable, as you said, pleasurable. Um, yep. is, that, is this a fair kind of summary of the two? Yes. Two concepts yeah, so, here. So a lot of expression, pleasurable, satisfying expression, plus a little bit of uh, information about auditory targets. So, mm -hmm. oh, you're, 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 think a little bit, think dark to the front instead of thinking E to the front, think that E to the front, E, that E sound, and let them imitate, let them play and imitate. Yeah. I see. Uh, so, Ken, thank you so much for your time with us. Uh, before we sign off, though, also don't, don't forget to shout out stuff that you have that's cool. I know you've got a couple books, so you probably have couple, some couple content online. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. Right. So, 
Practical Vocal Acoustics is one book, and it's now with Roman and Littlefield, and Kinesthetic Voice Pedagogy with Inside View Press. Kinesthetic Voice Pedagogy 2, second edition. That 2 is put in the title just to make sure you get the right edition. Uh, and with Inside View Press, Scott McCoy's press. Also, there's some articles, but, but if you go to kenbozeman.com, you can find links to find most of the things about me, and it'll lead you to my Lawrence Faculty website, which has even more things on it. But the, the, that URL is a little more complicated to, to remember. So kenbozeman.com, there's a link on the homepage that'll take you to my faculty website where you can find a lot of posted recordings of lectures that I've done on this subject. That's awesome. And this I've learned a lot. I think people are going to have a lot to chew on from this. I appreciate your time, Ken. Thank you very much. Okay. I enjoyed doing it. All right. Okay. So I'll trim it right there. Um, the, uh, the This episode is... Away, gonna, right? Yes. This episode will come out in about a week and a half. Okay. Um, and between now and then, I'll take your headshot. I will create a... Uh, a graphic that has kind of a little summary of our conversation. I always send that to the guest ahead of time to make sure that you feel comfortable with how I summarize the conversation or if I didn't yep. have any typos or or whatever. Um, and then uh, the other thing is I'll put your bio in the in the show notes. I'll put link to your website in the show notes. Uh, if there's any other anything else you think of, uh, feel free to send I'm it at me between now and then. That'll be Sounds awesome. Good. That's great. And if you wouldn't mind, uh, do you have a way to send the uh the soprano the file that you played um f at the beginning of the the conversation is yeah, it like there's a i i pulled which one do you i, I pulled it off of a uh, youtube but i can i can send you information about oh that. Yep. well then then yeah that i so if you just send me the link to the youtube video then yep. that that'll be fine because some sometimes i find that if i play it from the source and audio it, then it's better it sounds better to the audience you so can I'll run play. it through your own Voce Vista and play with it. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Yeah. yeah, that sounds good. All right. Well, thank you so much. This was fun. Okay. Cheers. Right. Bye-bye. Thank you, of course, for sticking around to the end. I love the people who hear my voice at the end of a podcast because that means you are the MVPs, the, the listeners that keep my ratings going all the way to the end, and I appreciate that. It also just means you're amongst the most curious. You are a true Coralosopher if you are listening at this point. So thank you so much. Don't forget to enter the Coralosophy code in all of the affiliates' websites. That is EndeavorMusicPublishing.com. That is GraphitePublishing.com. That's SightReadingFactory.com. Voce Vista, as you heard a lot about in this episode, as well as MyMusicFolders.com. You can enter Coralosophy at checkout in any of those websites. It helps me, and it helps you save money for your program. Stick around. We will get at some more topics next week. See you then. <laughs>